And so you can already see from the title, Humans Over Herds, Complementary and Alternative Medicine Providers, Individualized Approaches to Vaccination in Switzerland, that this might be potentially a little bit provocative for those of us who work in uh, public health. And um, just, I'll make it very clear that the humans over herds idea, it's not something that came from our research team. This is actually a research result. So it's not at all an endorsement, um, but it's more of a reporting of results that we had. Um, before beginning, I would just like to say that I'm at this exciting time in my PhD. I'm, I'm going to be finishing in March. And this conference has actually been very special for me um, throughout my PhD. And about six months after I began, I came here, uh, this was two years ago now, to my first NC conference. And it was really a great time for me to learn quite a bit about vaccine hesitancy under immunization. This is really a room full of experts, the people that you read, that you cite, and it's a really great place to interact with you all. So thank you. Um, so without any further ado, I'll tell you some of the goals of the presentation. I would like to give you an overview of our overall NRP 74, it's National Research Program 74 uh, study design, to provide a brief review on studies into complementary and alternative medicine, and I will probably refer to them as CAM, just because it's much easier to say. Uh, CAM, vaccine hesitancy and under immunization, and then to give an overall uh, an overview of the qualitative study design, which is a part of the NRP study. And then I will share some of the findings about the CAM provider approaches to vaccinations in Switzerland. And so you, those of you who were here last year had a brief introduction to this um, with Philip, talked uh, right over here, Philip Tarr, who's the PI of our study. This is a national Swiss study uh, that goes for four years. Uh, we're about halfway through right now. Two research phases. We had a mixed methods approach. We began with the qualitative phase, and that's kind of been my PhD baby. Um, and we've done this in the German and French-speaking part of Switzerland. We've done semi-structured interviews with parents, with providers, both CAM and biomedical. And I put them in um, quotation marks because that the distinction between CAM and biomedical providers in Switzerland is a bit blurred. Um, in the sense that CAM is often provided by biomedically trained medical doctors in Switzerland who have additional CAM training. Okay, So just remember that as I'm talking about CAM, I'm not talking about CAM in other contexts, but in the Swiss context where many of them are medically trained. We also did some observations of medical consultations. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, discourse analysis, I'm not going to talk about that too much because that's more about my PhD work and not for this presentation. The second part of our study, which we are in the middle of now, we're doing some data collection, is the quantitative phase. And this was really informed by uh, what we learned in the qualitative phase, so really using the mixed methods approach wisely. Um, and then we're also uh, administering the PACV15 um, and then in year four, so that's coming up, we will be proposing some kind of intervention. And I want to stress that um, we are not focusing on intervening with the CAM providers, but more likely using some kind of communication tools that we've learned from the ways that the CAM providers communicate with their patients. Um, and that I will also point out that we do not seek to implement mandatory vaccination. It's very um, apropos after our discussion before lunch. Um, so just a little bit what the literature tells us about CAM in medicine and, and its relationship to vaccination. When we look at the quantitative studies on this topic, um, we can think about why people use CAM. And so there's a lot of literature on this that shows that why people use CAM varies. It can include dissatisfaction with biomedicine, satisfaction with the CAM encounter, alternative perspectives or views towards biomedicine. Um, CAM providers can spend more time on their consultations, which patients tend to prefer. And CAM providers emphasize participatory consultations, shared decision making, and patient-centered approaches. Um, another vein of this research looks at who the people are that use CAM. And in Switzerland, CAM users are more likely to have a chronic illness or poor health status, be women middle-aged and have attained higher levels of education. The studies also associate CAM use and vaccine hesitancy and or under immunization. Uh, this is explained in terms of spirituality as a source of information, intuitive as opposed to analytic thinking styles, and openness to new experiences. However, it's, we need to point out that there's not, it's difficult to establish some kind of causal relationship here. Um, and this might be explained by confounding factors such as higher income, high education, or distrust of the medical system. 
Uh, and when it comes to qualitative studies, we ask different types of questions. Um, there's a bit of research that looks at the epistemological differences between CAM approaches and biomedical approaches to medicine, meaning what do we know, how do we know it, um, thinking that there's a different knowledge base uh, between these two groups. There's some nice anthropological work on that. Um, qualitative studies show that CAM is often perceived by patients as being able to do no harm or as being risk-free. So that's important when we're talking about vaccination. Um, qualitative studies also examine how trust can be developed in the patient-provider interaction, and they emphasize the processes of shared decision-making, also important in discussions on vaccination. Um, and this is some really, really nice research that came out, I believe, last year from Katie Atwell in the back smiling at me, uh, where you found that CAM users and CAM providers have a symbiotic relationship. And you said, vaccine hesitancy and CAM exist and function separately, but when combined, provide each other with resources that enable them to thrive together. In your article, you pointed how, out to um, the importance of people's abilities to exercise, patients' abilities to exercise agency, evoke natural approaches to health, and operate outside of medicine industry, uh, biomedicine industry, and big pharma. Um, but how are, studies with a specific focus on CAM providers and patient-provider interactions are scarce, uh, rare. I'm not even sure if we had found anything that had, spoke, had focused specifically on this. So that's kind of the gap that we were hoping to fill with this work. And that leads me to talk a little bit about the Swiss context and vaccination coverage. In Switzerland, vaccination is on a voluntary basis. Uh, the Swiss Federal Office of Public Health makes recommendations and then communicates these recommendations to the public. There's generally high coverage in Switzerland. It depends on the vaccine we're talking about. Um, and this has remained rather stable or even slightly increased over the past 20 years. In general, uh, the French and Italian speaking cantons have slightly higher uh, coverage than in the German speaking cantons. And here it's, it's more relevant for the, the discussions about measles and especially in the past couple of years. Um, and this is something that the Swiss Federal Office of Public Health said in me about measles in a report from two years ago, that Switzerland has only partially reached its objectives in terms of vaccination. For instance, flares of measles still occur in parts of Switzerland, taking advantage of locally low rates of vaccination. And cases tend to cluster around anthroposophic schools, and so that means Ru Rudolf Steiner, Waldorf schools, and other CAM providers, which brings us to CAM attitudes, use, and practices in the Swiss context. In general, in Switzerland, there's rather favorable attitude towards CAM, with, depending on the study and the methodology that was used, that report uh, between 25 and 50 percent of the population using or expressing positive attitudes towards CAM services. It's often provided by medical doctors with additional CAM training. Reimbursement is provided through basic mandatory health insurance when it is provided by medical doctors who have additional training in anthroposophic medicine. And both Ev and uh, Suzanne know a little bit about anthroposophic medicine when you came to visit us. We went to their uh, center in close to Basel, the Gutianum, and had a nice tour. Um, also covers traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture, homeopathy, and phytotherapy, which is herbal medicine. Um, there is additional supplementary insurance that you can get that, apply, that can cover these other services not covered by the basic, um, and that also non-medical uh, doctors, providers of CAM, undergo training and receive accreditation in order to get some kind of supplementary insurance. So this comes to our study and what we did. Um, this is overall this, the qualitative study design. We talked to CAM providers, we talked to biomedical providers, uh, talked to parents, and then did qualitative in interviews and observed some medical consultations. For the purpose of this presentation, we will be focusing over here with the CAM providers. Um, so I'll just only be able to focus on them and share results about what we learned with the CAM providers. So just for a little bit of background information about our study tools, what we used um, for data collection, I think this is important to report when we're doing qualitative work. Our interview guides with the CAM providers covered issues related to their, their training, their background, and context. Thoughts about vaccination, their perspectives, their information sources on vaccines, vaccination benefits and risks, uh, and then thinking about public health and individual choice considerations. These were open-ended questions so that they could respond 
uh, in their own words. We also asked them about Swiss recommendations and vaccination rates, um, whether they thought that the recommendations were appropriate, what they thought about current coverage, um, and then we asked them to describe their discussions with their patients. We want to hear how it goes for them uh, in practice. And then we asked them about the questions that patients might have, how much time they can spend on vaccination, and then the recommendations that they end up making to their patients. And this is something that we combined with our interview approach, and this is something that Ev was quite interested in and she wanted to learn a little bit about from us, is that we did these medical consultation observations. So basically I and um, Two other researchers sat in the, not all together, but in, in the different linguistic region. We sat in the corner and uh, lurked and observed and wrote down some notes um, about what was going on in the consultation. And you'll see this is an excerpt of my beautiful uh, scribbles. And so we write these ethnographic notes as, um, as the consultation is going on. Then we go back later and then type it up into a more beautiful format in a narrative format. We just describe everything we had based upon our notes. And then in a more structured approach, we had a medical consultation observation guide. And so here was where we could write down items of interest um, that, that's captured in the vaccine hesitancy literature, things like how much time they actually spent discussing vaccination, which vaccinations were discussed, et cetera. So in, in all, we were able to talk to 17 providers about half in uh, the French-speaking part of Switzerland and uh, about another half in the German-speaking part. Different types, we have anthroposophic, homeopathic, traditional Chinese medicine. And then you'll see almost all of them are medical doctors except for two of them, okay? And then we were able to observe 18 vaccination consultations with these providers. And now we'll get to the fun part. We'll talk about the results. What did we learn from them? And so one of the things that was, um, not really surprising to us, but it's really important to highlight, is that there were very few categorical, and by that I mean completely pro or completely anti, there were few categor categorical stances about vaccination among the, the sample that we had here. Um, they rather talked about vaccination as a vaccine by vaccine or case by case basis. Two, I will say that two out of the 17 providers reported being vocally anti-vaccine. It's interesting to note that those two providers, they were trained medical doctors and they were not the two untrained uh, CAM practitioners we talked to. So I think that's important to note that they did go through medical school and then they're still actively uh, anti-vaccine. Some of the doubts and or concerns that they mentioned about vaccination had to do with the long-term negative effects of vaccines on immune systems. A lot of these things, they're not so new if you, if you read the literature about vaccine hesitancy. Unknown long-term effects of aluminum, um, and then they did talk about when they deviated from the Swiss Federal Office of Public Health recommendations. So they either delayed vaccinations, they cherry picked, um, they gave vaccine specific recommendations. For example, don't do the HPV vaccine for kids who are 11 to 14, wait till they're older, or don't do the HPV vaccine for boys. So there it's clearly not adhering to the Swiss guidelines. Um, and then they had a few differences in opinion about monovalent versus polyvalent uh, vaccines. Um, when it comes to experiential knowledge and evidence-based medicine, uh, for this we saw that there were qu uh, quite a few critiques of biomedicine and health authorities. Two themes came about um, in, in this part of the data analysis. They talked quite a bit of the role of ed evidence, what types of evidence we look at, and how they consider evidence. And here their, their perspectives were framed in terms of their own clinical experiences and patients' vaccine experiences, and I'll show a few examples of that. Um, another theme had to do with CAM providers' legitimacy in claims making, particularly in claims that question the status quo. How legitimate are they? Can they say uh, these types of things? And with what degree of legit legitimacy? Um, and these perspectives diverge quite a bit from generally accepted consensus on health and illness. And so coming back to the role of evidence, in general, providers talked about uh, how they knew things. They would say, in my experience, a colleague told me, I know from experience. And so epistemologically, this is really interesting to think how they know what they know. It's, it, they're expressing it experientially. Um, however, they did provide us this nice caveat, and they said, take these accounts with a grain of salt, because they're not necessarily irrefutable proof in favor or against vaccination. And 
here's an example. Um, this is Dr. Laurent, who has patients that are less vaccinated than the norm. He says, I know from experience, this is kind of a case in point, I, I know from experience that I have patients with less severe asthma. Well, maybe it's due in part to other things. So he recognizes his patients might, for other reasons, uh, have less severe asthma, but some of it is still linked to vaccination in his mind. Another example, Miss Boulieu, she's not uh, medically trained. And these are pseudonyms, by the way. I'm not, <laughs> let's be anonymous. Um, so Miss Boulieu is a homeopathic provider, and she's not a trained medical doctor, and she's talking about treating patients who claim they've had uh, severe adverse reactions after being vaccinated. There's what I think and what I see. And now, with 10 years of practice, I see that non-vaccinated children are sick much less. That is evidence, all the same. Dr. Dupont, um, on the number, and he's talking about the number of vaccine-related symptoms reported by patients throughout his career. Since my patients often come for a second opinion for difficult cases, I see a lot of people who have had problems with vaccines. I have a deformed, meaning skewed, vision because of this. There might not be a scientific correlation, but it is important to listen to people who say, listen, since I've had this vaccine, I don't feel well. Science should take into account what these people experience and what they feel. When it comes to critiques of biomedicine, one of the things that was quite clear and as a theme that came up was that illness is no longer tolerated in modern society due to its inconvenience. Here, Dr. Laurent, again, uh, talking about Rudolf Steiner's philosophy about develop the developmental advantages of childhood illnesses. Children transform their bodies, uh, I, sorry, that's a typo. Children transform their bodies into what they need through their childhood illnesses. So advocating for going through some of these diseases. Dr. Dupont says about measles, well, you know, we didn't used to make such a monster out of it. Dr. Kimig, um, about exposing children to infection. I always said that we should set up a rubella hotline. If you have a five or six year old daughter, you can call. Hey, is there someone with rubella around here? Then you can go there for a, bit, a visit. Maybe she'll get infected. And so the idea here is that if parents are willing to go through this and the, the parents are willing to take off of work for two weeks and take care of sick children, that that's a choice that the parents can make for their child. And the doctors are willing to support the parents in this decision. It's not the doctors who want to make the decision for them, but they're willing to, to go through that process with the parents. Other critiques of biomedicine, um, the providers expressed interest in having the Swiss uh, Federal Office of Public Health clearly stating potential health risks of vaccines to the public. Dr. Ferrand said that there was some kind of knowledge gap. The Federal Office of Public Health uh, information is really good, but when it comes to some of the gray areas, we're in this kind of magma of information that's very, very difficult to sift through. We kind of have the impression that the, the Federal Office of Public Health and the Vaccine Commission only show studies that are, and he didn't finish that sentence, there are studies showing that there might be complications. Scientific honesty would have it so that those studies are also shared so that we could have that specific element. As a result, we must look further than what the, the office tells us. Um, the... Doctors thematically question public health arguments about vaccination in the Swiss context. During a consultation, Dr. Uh, Buchmann alluded to the, in t the potential infectious other, saying there are cases of polio, you know, in Egypt, Nigeria, and similar countries, but if you don't have contact with people from those countries or travel there, the risk of contracting polio in Switzerland is very small. Okay, so basically showing the, this idea that Switzerland is a safe space. And then Dr. Laurent, and this quote is actually where the title of the presentation comes from. He really sums up these perspectives here. We now know that there are not two individuals who are exactly the same. However, for me, vaccination comes from the practice of veterinary medicine. They're now referring to us as herds. That's not human medicine for me, especially when it's practiced in a mandatory way. And so Really, as I was reading this qualitative data over and over and over, trying to make sense of it, I, I read this and I said, this really sums up a lot of these approaches, thinking we treat humans, not herds. And so this is a really nice way for me to advertise for a publication that we 
just got accepted. Um, so we treat humans, not herds. And this is a theme that really summarized what uh, the, the CAM providers talked about in our interviews with them. Um, I'm almost done, Suzanne. And this is going to be the last uh, section of results that I'll share with you before I conclude. And really, it comes down to how they do this in practice is that they emphasize individualized choice. CAM providers focused on individual patients, families, and their specific context. They employed individualized approaches by incorporating parents' pre-existing knowledge and perceptions on vaccination and vaccine-preventable diseases, parents' wishes and concerns, and parents' histories, physical constitution, medical history, and social and family contexts. So just a few examples of Dr. Ferrand talking about vaccination discussions with parents. First, I go over the vaccines one by one. And for each one, I asked the patients what type of information that they had sought out. What information do they already have? What are their concerns about vaccinations? I tell them the FOPH recommendations. Then I tell them my information. Sounds quite similar to some of the methodologies that we're pushing in this room and that we're studying, right? See what the patients know, hear where they're at, and then offer them information. Some observation notes from a, a consultation showed uh, that a mother nodded, she took out two pieces of paper covered in handwritten notes, so she's a bit hesitant. She said that she was unsure if she would vaccinate her daughter and that her husband knew some people uh, who had been harmed. They were not really sure if this was true. She said that she was generally fearful and careful person, so hearing things like this scared her. The doctor said that she was not against vaccinations but preferred alternative schedules. She also stated that she didn't want to vaccinate during the full moon or two days before or after, and that she always tested vaccinations kinesiologically before administering them. And if you don't know what that is, that's great because I'll show you. <laughs> the next part of the observation. So the mother, I, this wasn't a consultation I observed, but when I read these notes, I thought this was just super interesting. The mother held the daughter in her lap, and the way it was explained to me is she held her arms like this, then the daughter was holding the vaccines, and then the the doctor came and pushed on her arm, and whichever one moved meant that that was going to be a well-tolerated vaccine, if I remember correctly. I would not tolerate the vaccine. So then the mother's arm dropped slightly for one specific vaccine, and then the doctor concluded that the mother should elect for the other one if she chooses to vaccinate. So really, going through this process of making, I mean, to the mother, it's very much, uh, how am I going to react? It's very individualized. We've talked to this to other more biomedically oriented CAM providers. And they're like, why are you reporting this? This is crazy. And <laughs> we said, but it's evidence and it's, it's a practice that occurred and it was clearly of importance because it influenced the way the mother made her decision. Um, I think I just have two more examples and then I'll conclude. Um, Another consultation, um, the mother spontaneously brought up vaccinations. She was rather apprehensive and hesitant. She explained, for vaccines, we will only do the most basic ones. I prefer waiting, and I only want the most important ones. She was unsure which ones were most important and asked for recommendations. The doctor then asked if the son went to a nursery. She said that she didn't want to send him. The doctor began explaining the Swiss recommendations, and then he stopped to ask the mother if she had female friends with children. So really going from the the general recommendations and, and what uh, the Federal Office of Public Health wants us to do, then talking about the mother's personal context, if she had female friends with children. She said that there were no children in her social entourage and that she always asked friends to disinfect hands before holding the son. Mother glanced at the schedule again and then asked about minimum recommendations. He explained that it was difficult to determine and that it was her choice. It's up to you to decide. So this brings me to the, the conclusion and discussion points. The CAM providers included in our study sample tended to frame vaccination in terms of individual choice and personal context with their patients. Providers were not categorically opposed to vaccination. Rather, they expressed nuanced, context-specific, vaccine-specific attitudes and argued in favor of patient choice. Providers were aware of the professional implications of questioning vaccination. One of the doctors told us how it was how that being anti-vaccine in a university setting is a career killer. And then through their engagement, and this is something that we're arguing, and it's maybe a bit provocative, and I would be happy to discuss that with you, is that through engagement in dialogue with uh, these parents over time, these CAM providers in our sample undertook work that likely addresses some of the more complex determinants of vaccine hesitancy, and those related to trust, 
Uh, for example, Dr. Schmidt explained, I have the impression that if we take the time and explain vaccination well, the majority will end up vaccinating. Maybe they vaccinate less, but we can still get them vaccinated. So really thinking about the goals of these vaccination consultations. Is it uptake or is it addressing the more complicated uh, determinants of vaccine hesitancy? And so can providers' individualized approaches align with other larger socio-medical trends and provide insight into some of the more complex determinants of vaccine hesitancy, particularly as they relate to recent trends like healthism, risk culture, consumer-driven approaches to healthcare, individualized patient center approaches, um, and then incorporating experiential knowledge into decision-making and maximizing patient agency. And I think the last point I wanted to make today is that these individualized approaches to vaccination, they underscore and exemplify some of the larger tensions of current debates in public health, and they can prompt us to reflect about the question of and the role of individualized approaches to medicine in public health. Thank you for listening, and I had the support of a wonderful team.